not sure you can hear in the back, but the question is about graduate education, uh, the lifeblood of our future, and what are we doing to try to be sure that we preserve as much as possible of that incredibly important part of the pipeline. We, I, I have an advisory committee of high-level individuals that I ask to convene and look at this topic, and Shirley Tillman, who's recently stepped down as the president of Princeton, worked with a senior member of my staff to do an analysis of the biomedical research workforce, because on any given day, I will have somebody saying to me, we're not training nearly enough PhDs in biomedical research. And somebody else saying, you're training way too many PhDs in biomedical research, there aren't jobs out there for them. They can't both be right. So we did that analysis and collected a lot of data, and it's not that easy to come up with some of this data, particularly about trainees that come from other countries that we are not as able to track because we don't directly support them because Congress asked us to spend our training money on American citizens. But one thing we did learn is that, in fact, only about one out of four of the graduate students and postdocs that have been supported by NIH as part of their training end up in tenure-track positions at research universities. And yet, most of our trainees expect that that's what they're being trained for. And they try to model themselves off after their research mentors, who in general are uh, tenured or tenure track professors at research universities. And so we're kind of setting them up. Now, the other three quarters don't end up being unemployed. The good news is the unemployment rate for biomedical research PhDs is very small, maybe 2%. But they do all kinds of other interesting things in industry, in science policy, in journalism, in academic situations that are not tenure track but are incredibly important parts of the scientific engine. But we need to be clear that our training programs are designed to support all of those outcomes, and that somebody who doesn't end up on the tenure track doesn't then get seen as somehow having been second rate. Uh, and we are re-engineering our training programs to try to do that. So that's one thing about our graduate programs. And I think we can say for sure that if you get into one of these programs, you're going to have an interesting job may not be exactly like what your mentor is doing, but it will be fascinating and worthwhile. Certainly in terms of the funding that goes into this, I'm deeply concerned that both the long period of time involved in graduate training and postdoctoral training and the fact that our stipends have not been keeping up very well means that the average trainee is leaving an awful lot of money on the table compared to people who have decided to do something else and to take some other professional pathway. And that's unfair. So we need to try to increase the stipends. And we have been doing that even in the face of very difficult budgets, because I just think we have to make up for that. And we need to also have constraints on the period of time where a graduate student is in training and how long a postdoc should be, because some of these go on longer than they should be for the health of the individual. Postdocs, for instance, are wonderful engines for doing science, but they ought not to be kept in that position indefinitely. They ought to be given a chance to get out there and spread their wings. One program I've started, which I'm excited about because of the uh, kinds of individuals it's attracting, is a program to skip the postdoc and to give particularly independent-minded graduate students a chance to go straight from their doctoral degree to being an independent investigator. Oftentimes, therefore, in their late 20s or early 30s, as opposed to the average age of getting your first NIH grant, which is now 42, which is very unhealthy. Uh, the best day I have each year is when we bring in the new uh, grantees for this early independence program. These are the most amazingly fearless, creative, visionary uh, young scientists you can imagine uh, who are ready to just absolutely spread their wings. And that's a signal to me that we should be doing more of that. We shouldn't be so locked into this idea that you have to stay in somebody else's laboratory uh, for a decade before you're ready your own master. We have to work on that, and I'm certainly pushing things to do that. We have other programs like that, the K99 awards that make it possible for postdocs to go seamlessly from a training period to an independent faculty position and makes them very recruitable. Uh, there's lots more that we can be doing and are looking into, but I agree with you. This has got to be a major focus of where we turn our attention and, and be sure we're doing right uh, by these folks who come into our midst expecting their training is going to be ideal uh, for their future and that we will set them up uh, for a powerful and successful career. We're doing a lot of that, but we could do
two more. Thank you. I am under strict instructions not to go over time. I had one to ask a couple of other questions. The next question that I was going to welcome was from a graduate student, but I think we will not have time for it. We have to do that. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Caitlin. Thank you very much. My name is Kayla Munchard, and I'm an MD PhD student here at the University of Kansas Medical Center. And um, thank you very much for being here this morning, and congratulations. Um, my question is about the future of biomedical research. And as you can see, there's a lot of energy and excitement here in the state of Kansas about biomedical research. And I was just wondering if you could comment on um, what you think the next frontiers might be in biomedical research. What a great question to be able to uh, do some thinking and talking about. Well, sure, um, it's hard to pick any one thing because the uh, potential is so enormously compelling. One area that I think all of us are particularly jazzed about right now is neuroscience. The opportunity uh, with the tools and technologies that are being developed to be able to really understand how the human brain works, how the circuits uh, that are constituted by these 86 billion neurons you have inside uh, your brain are able to do just amazing things, uh, processing information, uh, initiating some sort of voluntary uh, movement, uh, laying down a memory, retrieving it. And how do those circuits go wrong uh, in disease and what can we do about it in something like autism or schizophrenia or epilepsy? The Brain Initiative, which just announced uh, a year ago and which has been strongly supported uh, by the Congress uh, with the uh, current uh, funding uh, for FY14, which is making it possible to get this going, is going to be a 10 or 15 year effort because it's incredibly bold and audacious to imagine that we might actually figure out how the brain works. Some people have argued that our brains are not complicated enough to understand our brains. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have computers, maybe they will help us. Uh, and that will be a big part of it. So that's certainly an area. In terms of the more direct uh, medical applications, there's enormous excitement about personalized medicine, about the ability to be able, using the tools of genomics and, and other approaches, to individualize our approach to disease instead of doing one size fits all. And that's happening right now in cancer in a big way, but starting to happen in other areas as well. Rare diseases, even though they may individually affect not so many people, we put it all together, 25 million people in the United States are affected by a rare disease. And these are the diseases which in many ways are having their molecular causes discovered most quickly, <laughs> putting us in a position to be able to design therapeutics for those. And that's a big part of what NCATS and NIH is aiming at and what all of our institutes are interested in seeing happen. And it's enormously gratifying when you see one of those success stories where a rare disease that seemed like it was a hopeless case is uncovered in terms of its cause and a therapy emerges maybe by repurposing some other drug that was designed for something else. Uh, we're seeing more and more of those kinds of things happening. But again, I'm always worried if I mention a few things, I won't have mentioned enough. <laughs> One final thing is all of this is putting us in this big data situation, which is something to welcome and not be afraid of, but to be ready for. <laughs> with electronic health records now being increasingly available, with genomics and imaging strategies to be able to collect very large data sets on, on cells or individuals, we are going to be having a, an amazing opportunity to sift through petabytes of information and glean those nuggets of information uh, that are going to launch uh, the next generation of ideas. But we better be sure we're ready for it. So anybody, I think, who wants a career now in biomedical research really needs to pay attention uh, to getting some sophistication in computational skills because uh, that is going to be essential. But it's also going to be great fun. Thank you, Dr. Collins, and again, Senator Moran, congratulations on your Champion of Science Award. And thanks to all of you for being here today and participating in these activities with us this morning. Uh, Dr. Collins and the Senator have a full day ahead, and so we're going to need to uh, bring this session to conclusion. And again, thank you so much for being here, and let's thank our guests. I was hoping you had the answer, Dr. Collins. <laughs> Well, I think, okay, uh, Dr. Jensen, I think the answer to that question is related to the previous answer, which is funding at the federal level, as it is true in legislatures and state capitals across the country, is in part determined by the input of 
citizens that you represent. And so the continued effort by certainly people at, at the university who are involved in research matters. But let me tell you, there's a whole array of folks, many of them in this room, who, have, who are now dedicating their lives toward caring for someone who has a disease, but as part of that care, trying to make certain that there are cures and treatments that are found for others in similar circumstances. And so there's a whole set of folks here, uh, Down Syndrome, American Diabetes Association, National Cancer, the, those associations and the individual Kansans or Americans who come knocking on our doors make such compelling cases. So part of it is just, uh, again, the, the, the knowledge and information and the action, the request by people to do something to solve problems that cause members of Congress, state legislators to respond. I think that uh, in addition to that, we've got to make certain that we understand. I think the story that Dr. Collins is such a, a he's a great storyteller and he's a, a great advocate for the young researcher. You can appeal to our pride as Americans to make certain that medical research is conducted in the United States as compared to losing our best and brightest to some other place or to those who leave the profession. So there's a, a great opportunity to, to tell the story that in the absence of a strong, consistent commitment to medical research, we're going to lose the next generation of research scientists who decide They're not going to put up with that uncertainty. Unfortunately, most of our students today graduate with uh, significant, huge amounts of debt, student loan debt, and the ability just to do something that doesn't pay or you don't know is going to pay next year is no longer an option. Even if you love science, you still have to figure out how to put food on the table. And so you either lose the folks to some other profession, some other career path, or we lose them to China and elsewhere, who has, other countries are making this decision, prioritizing research where the United States is no longer doing so. And so I think the, the economic engine, American pride, the need to make certain that we don't lose another generation, all begin to come together. And just like throughout our history of our, of our nation, Someone who leads that cause, somebody who expresses those views, began to gather people who began to understand, yes, this is important. Uh, and I think the, Dr. Collins made this point this morning, and I, I hadn't thought of it exactly in these terms, but you may remember um, in a time frame, 2000 something, doubling the, uh, the, the amount of money devoted to research, we, we, we set the goal in Congress of doubling the amount of money going to NIH. And over a period of time, we accomplished that. Unfortunately, this is the point that Dr. Collins made this morning, we then looked the other way. We dropped the ball and decided, well, we've done all we need to do. We doubled the, the, the dollars available for scientific research in this country. And when the doubling came to an end, then we dropped back down, and now we're slowly trying to, to work our way out of a much lower beginning level than where we would have been if we could have just continued from the point And I, I think, I mean, the reason that resonates with me is that my guess is that most members of Congress, uh, including me previously, would never have realized that once we doubled, we just didn't continue the trajectory that we were on. We dropped back, back down to where, and in, in fact, Dr. Collins, he talked about how we, have, we are uh, expending $30 billion dollars a year in medical research at NIH. But had we just continued with, without doubling the amount of money available had continued on a path that included compensation for inflation, medical inflation, we'd be at $40 billion dollars today, $10 billion dollars more than where we are. And again, that's just a thought that never occurred to me uh, in the days in which I was just pleased where we doubled NIH funding. We're now, we're on a path to continue doing great things. Um, doctor, you look like you're, you're ready to answer this question. I'd be glad to, to defer. <laughs> I can answer it better than you just have. And it is interesting, you're just mentioning the fact that Congress was, in 1998, able to come together and say, we're going to make a five-year plan uh, to double the NIH. That was bipartisan, obviously at an easier economic moment than the one we're in the midst of right now. But at least there is a precedent then 
we're thinking about a trajectory that in more than one year increments. And I will say, as the NIH director, to try to manage something as complex and as long term as biomedical research in one year increments is certainly a challenge. If we could you imagine a possibility of where each year, of course, you have to come up with an appropriation, but you have a longer term goal in mind uh, of trying to achieve some sort of trajectory, which of course year by year has to be considered to see if you could do it or not, but at least something in the way of a longer, longer horizon. That would be enormously helpful, I think, uh, for medical research in terms of getting some sense of where we're likely to go, recognizing that nothing can be a promise in an uncertain fiscal environment. Use this opportunity to, to talk about spending in the budget just for a moment uh, in a bigger picture. Here are a couple of challenges or areas that we have to address. First, the challenge 30% of what we appropriate, what we spend in Washington, D.C., is appropriated on an annual basis. Among that 30% is funding for NIH. We cannot balance the budget or write the fiscal condition of our country in only dealing with the 30%. When we try to do that, the result that we get is what you see with the flat line, lack of uh, increasing in, uh, for inflation that NIH currently receives. And so in, in my view, I'm, I, I believe that the fiscal condition of our country is hugely important, but recognize that you cannot solve this problem only with dealing with the 30% each year. Otherwise, you will, and they're not nickels and dimes, but that's a Kansas expression. We will nickel and dime things in ways that we don't get the benefit that we otherwise would get. The other 70% is so-called mandatory spending, and that's the part that Congress and this president refuse to deal with. And until we deal with that broader picture, we're going to be nickel and diming to the tune of hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, nickel and dime, this part over here that can't solve our country's fiscal future. So the, the call is for Congress and the leadership of this country to come together and deal with those broader issues of the other 70% Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, things that need attention because of demographics. Our population of our country has changed and the number of people working versus the number of people retiring deserves some kind of attention and not just the politicians who look the other way. The, that just is a reality that we've got to face or you're going to see this continual pressure on the 30% of which NIH I'll shorten my two points to, to one since I talked so long. I'm, I'm worried that I became a member of the United States Senate and started talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. The uh, next question is from Dean Otis, School of Pharmacy. An impromptu question. <laughs> <laughs> 